The cool Gaudi of today is a pleasant inland town which has retained many aspects of its rich and colourful past. The Shire of Coolgardie has a population of approximately 5,000 people and encompasses an area of 30,400 square kilometres. It incorporates four townships, namely Coolgardie itself, Cambalda, Cambalda West and Widgie Multha. The township of Coolgardie is situated 558 kilometres from Perth and 38 kilometres from Kalgoorlie. The local industries within the Shire consist mostly of gold mining, nickel mining, pastoral, tourism and commercial, retail and light industrial. Coolgardie's real attraction today is to give visitors an insight into the early pioneering life The many heritage listed buildings, combined with a well signed posted heritage trail, make it one of the must see places in the goldfields. The first Europeans to explore the area were H.M. Lefroy and C.C. Hunt, who were responsible for discovering a series of waterholes that helped open the inland for future settlement. Neither seemed to be aware of the huge riches in the ground that they walked over. There are a number of different suggestions about how the town got its name. One source says it's a corruption of the Aboriginal words Kulgur Bidi, meaning tree by waterhole. Another says it's the Aboriginal name of a local type of tree, Cholagada. A third says the name was given to the town by Warden Finity after a nearby Nama hole, called Golgadi by the Aborigines. Yet another says it was the name of a boy who found water there. And finally, another one says the name comes from a native word for the Bangara, a large monitor lizard. One thing is certain, Warden Finity was the person responsible for sending telegram number 3098 to Perth, which read, Very rich quartz reef. Gold has been picked up on the surface. Four miles square in granite, ironstone and greenstone. And thus he sparked the largest gold rush in the nation's history. This would have been after Arthur Bailey rode into Southern Cross and deposited 554 ounces of gold with the mining warden. Bailey and his partner Ford had found gold at Fly Flat, 120 miles east of Southern Cross. When Bailey and Ford arrived at Fly Flat, they discovered a claim had already been pegged with the number 1888 on a piece of tin attached to one of the posts. It will probably never be known who pegged the claim, as two skeletons were found in a nearby gully where they had been speared by Aborigines. Within hours of the news leaking out about the find, a frenzied rush to the area now known as Kulgadi had begun, and with it one of the greatest movements of people in Australia's history. Bailey and Ford seemed to have been closely followed by three other men, one of whom was Tommy Talbot. Talbot always claimed that he and his friends discovered the gold reef that was to become known as Bailey's Reward. Ford is said to have pulled a gun on Talbot, who had no choice but to back down. Whatever the real story, it's sure that Bailey and Ford are the ones to prosper from this discovery. Bailey may have found out about the gold from Gillies McPherson, who staggered into Bailey's camp one day, and after being given food and drink, told Bailey about a gold find to the east of Southern Cross. The lack of water in the area had driven McPherson away, but Bailey remembered the conversation, and sometime later he and Ford set out to look for gold. Six months after Bailey's find, there were thousands of people living in tents on the gold fields, and Western Australia's population had increased by about 400%. They arrived by bicycle, dray, horse, or carrying their loads on their back, 
all intent on striking it rich. Many of those who came seeking fortunes found only hardship, sickness and death, as the booming settlement suffered the rigours associated with inadequate housing, food and medical supplies. Water became precious and more expensive than gold. It was only sheer determination and tenacity of purpose that allowed the survivors to continue. In the early days, there was no one of authority on the gold fields, and miners had to keep law and order themselves. There were any number of fights, and some thefts, but compared to the American Wild West, the West Australian goldfields were fairly tame. The miners had a way of administering their own justice, and this was known as the roll-up. Any miner with a grievance to settle would begin banging on a tin dish, until a number of other miners had gathered to hear his complaints. A jury and judge would then be selected from the assembled men, and the complaint was heard. The decision of the judge regarding punishment was binding, and the most serious offenders were quickly driven off the goldfields. Roll-ups continued to be used to enforce law and order on the goldfields until about 1903. It was certainly not the most hospitable country, and the 190-kilometre trek from Southern Cross, itself a remote town, must have been a bit too much for some people. Damn Coolgardie. Damn the track. Damn it there and damn it back. Damn the country. Damn the weather. Damn the goldfields. Altogether. Businesses sprang up to serve the people that arrived on the goldfields. And within a decade, Coolgardie had a population of 16,000 and became the third largest town in Western Australia. Its growth spawned the development of the Goldfields Water Scheme, and also the Eastern Goldfields Railway. By 1896, there was a post office and 26 hotels. Yeah, those miners were a thirsty bunch. And even electricity and a swimming pool. Scheme water arrived in 1903 with the pipeline. But all this was not enough when the gold began to run out. Along with the large number of pubs to cater for the thirsty miners, there was no lack of reading material. By 1895, Coolgardie had seven newspapers, including the Coolgardie Miner, Chronicle, Golden Age, Mining Review and T'other Soda. As the surface gold ran out, many prospectors left the fields, disillusioned and penniless. Others headed inland to Kalgoorlie, and later worked for mining companies for as little as $6 a week. In March 1899, the Coolgardie International Mining and Industrial Exhibition was opened, and ran until the 1st of July. The exhibition failed to get support from the other colonies apart from South Australia, but it was well supported locally, with over 61,000 people attending over the four months it operated. The onset of the Great War and the resulting depression in the price of gold drew many prospectors away from the gold fields, and so began the inevitable decline of Coolgardie. The original mine at Bailey's Reward continued to produce until 1963, when it finally closed. Over half a million ounces of gold had been recovered. Bailey and Ford left the area rich men selling Bailey's reward for £24,000, and Bailey South for £40,000. Bailey didn't long enjoy his wealth, as he died at the age of just 27. Ford did somewhat better, living until the age of 80. Talbot, who always claimed they'd stolen his find, also got rich, but not from gold. He did well from selling property, and died in Perth in 1952. Until the arrival of the pipeline, the lack of water was not only a problem for washing and drinking, as was shown by a fire that broke out in October 1895. It practically demolished the entire block, bounded by Lefroy, Bailey, Woodward and Hunt Streets. 
Two years later it happened again, and building with stone instead of wood suddenly became quite fashionable. Not surprisingly, a local fire brigade was established, with tanks of salt water put around the town and a bucket brigade used to try and stop any fires. Water shortages were so bad in some seasons that the authorities had to close the road to Kulgadi in order to stop travellers perishing along the way. Electric lights were installed in town in June 1896, and of course the pipe water arrived in 1903, but by this time Kulgadi was past its heyday, and Kalgoorlie was becoming the main centre in the area. The old courthouse has been lovingly restored and has been turned into one of the most impressive museums in the state. Unsurprisingly, the focus is on the goldfields and the history of Kulgadi. The courthouse is the, probably the most impressive building in town and is an ideal location for the museum. The displays are extensive and give a wonderful insight into life during the gold rush times. Covering two floors, the museum is certainly a must-see attraction, as is Warden Finity's house up on the hill in the outskirts of town. Warden Finity was a major character on the goldfields, acting as both magistrate and mining warden. He had a reputation for being tough but fair, and was widely respected among the miners. The house he lived in until his wife died in 1911 was unusual for its time, in that it had a double wall construction, with ventilation that ran up the inside gap to vents on the roof. This, combined with wide verandas, made the building comfortable to live in, even through the long hot summers. The house was restored and is now a museum that showcases a way of life that has long since passed into history. You can enjoy a Devonshire tea while you relax on the wide breezy veranda and contemplate what it may have been like to live there over a hundred years ago. There are many stories about Ward Infinity and the respect the miners had for him. But for me, one of the most amusing is the tale of two miners who were punished by Finity over some infraction and were told to stay in their tent until he could come back and deal with them properly at the end of the day. Finity returned in the evening, only to find the men roaring drunk. He was not at all amused, and asked for an explanation. Apparently, as the day had grown hotter and hotter, the men's thirst for a nice cool glass of beer became unbearable. So they had pulled up their tent, and carried it to the local pub, but had remained inside it while they drank their beer. It's said that Finity was so amused by their ingenuity and the fact that they had done what he instructed as he let them off with a mere warning. One building that seems to have great potential, but isn't being utilised very well, is the old railway station. This was once alive with passengers and freight arriving from Perth, but today it sits quiet and almost forgotten. It would make another excellent museum for the town, but there does not appear to be the will or the money to do anything with the lovely old building. <laughs> 